Trinity Church, and <coughs> two of them were this week, and I um, I forgot my cast and circles at the trailer, so that's why I'm not wearing them this morning. Uh, this is not a political statement or anything else. Uh, but yesterday, uh, when I got to the church at about 9.30, I found a note in the door, and I want to read it to you. To the wonderful members of Trinity Church who have helped Otis Gates and our food bank, many, many thanks. Otis keeps telling us about your good deeds and kindnesses. Signed Courtney Moran. This is from the St. Vincent de Paul Society. Uh, that's the kind of note I like find kind of stuck in the door. So that was that was made it a really great day. Um, and it, you know, in modern America, I, I suppose the uh, the goal is to have a life of wonderful parties. One after another. Uh, many people, I think, uh, just would uh, think they had died and gone to heaven if it could be like that. And in fact, when you read the Bible, you find a lot of parties. You find a lot of feasts and <coughs> celebrations. The Bible is literally full of them. We, all, we find weddings and wedding feasts. We find birthday parties in Genesis 40. And in Matthew 14:6. We hear about the birthday party, party of King Herod the Great. Uh, and these events were really quite elaborate. At King Herod's uh, birthday party, there were dancing girls. Can you imagine? Um, Jesus uh, gets to perform his first miracle at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Uh, and there he turned an enormous amount of water into the finest wine. Now, I don't know what the Baptists do with that, but the... Uh, uh, the Episcopalians love it, uh, and, and, and so they're, they're the finest wine is uh, provided so that the feast can go on and the host is not embarrassed. Uh, and so this morning it's not surprising that we find Jesus using the imagery of a wedding feast to teach his disciples. He's been talking about vineyards the last several weeks, but now he's talking about a wedding feast. Now, there's one more thing before we get into this. Jesus is often described as the bridegroom in both in, all, in the Gospels and in the Epistles. And in the Revelation of St. John, uh, we find the coming together of Christ and his disciples uh, described as a wedding feast, as a marriage feast. And, uh, and so this is a, what Jesus is using this morning is a very common image to, the, to his disciples. But he begins uh, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 22, simply by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent out invitations for the wedding banquet, and then he sent his servants to those whom he had personally invited to tell them to come. And then something goes wrong. Something goes terribly wrong. Quite unexpectedly, those who were invited refused to come. So the king sends out more servants to tell those who are invited, I have made ready my dinner. My ox and my fatty calves are killed. Everything is ready. Come to the feast. But they all refused. They all refused. And in the ancient world, they understood this as um, a sign that the world was full of evil people. They did not have a sense to even come to the, the banquet of the king. One went off to his field, another to his business. And then, to add insult to injury, the king's servants are seized, mistreated, and killed. It seems those are in, who are invited are embarrassed that they won't quit, that they keep reminding them that the feast is ready. Come. The feast is waiting. And so they are uh, the invited turn on the servants and kill them. The king, of course, is enraged. He sends out his army. He destroys those get, those former, uh, in, those who were invited, and he burns their city. And then he says to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. They were not worthy. Go into the street corners. Go into the highways and the byways and invite to the banquet 
anyone you find. The servants obey and go out into the streets and gather all the people they could find, good and evil, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. So the first batch all refused, and they were seen as evil. But this parable, and actually many people don't think this is a parable, they think it's an allegory, because it's so full of meaning, and some of it's very difficult. On, on another level, this allegory uh, it is about the worthy and the unworthy. The first batch are unworthy, but then those who do come to the face include the good and the evil. And here is where Americans start to get really kind of squirmy uh, because it sounds so unfair. How, how could somebody be invited and then thrown out because they aren't wearing a wedding garment? But in the ancient world, when you arranged for a wedding banquet, you set aside a room in which you placed extra wedding garments. So that if a guest had traveled for days to join you and somehow had arrived without a wedding garment, it didn't get packed or they didn't own one, you'd have one waiting for them. So there's no reason anyone should get into the banquet hall unprepared. No reason. But yet the king comes in to look at his guests, and there he saw a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. He had no defense, because there was no defense. Then the king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot, cast him into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen.